The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Quality of product is essential to continuing success. Exhibit A, Lucky Strike. In a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And today, tomorrow, always... Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. At FSM, American. Lucky Strike presents The Man Who Knows. Mr. Herbert Highsmith, veteran independent tobacco buyer of Robertsonville, North Carolina, has handled tobacco all his life. Recently, he said, Season after season, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy quality tobacco. Fine tobacco with real flavor. Smooth, ripe, and mild. So for myself, I pick Lucky's. Smoked them for 15 years. At auction after auction, independent tobacco experts like Mr. Highsmith can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. Remember, LSMFT, LSMFT. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, and fine tobacco means real deep down smoking enjoyment for you. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. Yes, next time you buy cigarettes, ask for Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, last Friday, October 21st, was Halloween. And people young and old all over the nation were bobbing for apples. Yes, sir. So now we bring you a man whose gums are so tender, he had to bob for applesauce, Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don... <laughs> Don, that was a very funny introduction, bobbing for applesauce. You know, it's certainly clever. I mean, the way you expose all my faults and defects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People enjoy it, too. Yes, yes, they do. Hmm. You know, Don, Don, there's a man in Pomona who gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning, looks at a thermometer, and then broadcasts frost warning. I know. Well, one more introduction like that, and you'll be his master of ceremony. <laughs> and incidentally, Halloween is on the 31st, not the 21st. <laughs> In other words... Oh, Jack, Don didn't mean any harm. He was just trying to get a little laugh, that's all. Mary, we want big laughs on this show. If Don has any little laughs, let him ship him east to Fred Allen. <laughs> And speaking of Halloween, Alan looks like he went bobbing for oranges and got a smudge pot caught under each eye. <laughs> he used them to warm up the audience, you know. Say, Jack, uh, is Fred Allen older than you are? Is he older? Mary. <laughs> this is cruel, but I've got to tell it. <laughs> well, this is awful, but I must have. Ask me again, Mary. Go ahead. All right. Uh, is Fred Allen older than you are? Is he older? Mary, Allen died in 1896. <laughs> what you hear on Sundays are transcriptions. <laughs> I wonder how he gets those transcriptions up here. <laughs> <laughs> but getting back to Halloween, Don, what did you do last Friday night? Did you have any fun? Oh, I had a one. Wonderful time, Jack. I went to a masquerade party. Really? What did you go as? I let a chain drag from the back of my belt and went as a gasoline truck. <laughs> well, that's logical. Don always thinks of something unique, doesn't he, Mary? Yeah, I remember last Halloween he painted lines across his back and went as a football field. Uh, it was a good illusion, except that the field spread out too much around the 10 yard line. <laughs> But everybody has fun on Halloween, especially the kids. Say, Jack, did you find out who put that sign up in front of your house? No. No, I didn't. What was that, Mary? <laughs> Somebody took a chop suey sign off a Chinese restaurant and nailed it over Jack's front door. Mary. A chop suey sign, huh? Was Jack mad? No, he just put a kimono on Rochester and went into business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just did that for a gag. But I had a lot of fun Friday night, too, Don. 
You know, I went to a Halloween party in Beverly Hills, and I met the most wonderful girl. And she was so cute. You know, she came dressed as Little Bo Peep. Little Bo Peep, that's a cute costume. Yeah. What did you wear, Jack? Well, I didn't know I was going till the last minute, so I just wore an old costume I found up in the attic. But kids, I gotta tell you about this girl. She wore a little black mask that seemed to... Oh, I don't know, she was just wonderful. Now, I really went nuts about her. Well, I never heard you talk like this before. I can't help it. When she came through the door, I looked at her, and she looked at me, and I could just feel something run up and down my spine. Mary, you know what that means. Your costume was up in the attic longer than you thought it was. <laughs> I'm serious, Mary. No, I'm serious. This girl didn't say much, but as we were dancing, she would look into my eyes and call me pumpkins. Pumpkins? Yeah. And I called her little Bo Peep. She was really the Mr. Cute... Benny, after the program is over, do you mind if oh, I... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. Mr. Benny, after the program is over, do you mind if I... Did you, did you just get in? Yeah. Mr. Benny, after the program is over, do you mind how, if I... Uh, how do you feel, kid? Fine. That's good. I had double pneumonia this morning, but I'm all right now. <laughs> Dennis, stop being silly. If you had double pneumonia this morning, how could you come to the studio? Did you take penicillin? No, I took the Sunset bus. <laughs> Well, kid, kid, all you had was a slight cold, that's all. How did you catch it? Well, on Halloween, I wanted to play a trick on my father, so I put a pail of ice water over the door so when he opened it, the water would fall on his head. But you put the ice water up there for your father. How did you catch the cold? Testing. <laughs> oh. It worked every time. Well, look, Dan. <laughs> Look, Dennis, if I'd have known you were going to stay at home on Halloween, I would have uh, taken you to a masquerade party at the Beverly Hills Club. Oh, I was supposed to go to that party with Phil, but my folks wouldn't let me, so Phil went alone. Phil was there? Gee, that's funny. I didn't see him. What was he dressed as? Little Bo Peep. <laughs> Little Bo Peep. Phil! Kiss me, pumpkins. <laughs> no, no wonder he wouldn't take off his mask. Phil, you, you mean Jack danced with you all evening? Not only that, Livy, he even asked me if he could drive me home. <laughs> no. Yeah. Say, Livy, have you ever seen the lights of the city from Mulholland Drive? <laughs> can't understand it. How could he shave so close? <laughs> Phil, I think you carried it too far. Why didn't you tell Jack who you were? What, and spoil an old man's evening? <laughs> All right, Phil, look at you fooled me. You had your little joke. Now let's forget it. Forget it nothing. I want them nylons you promised me. Alice can use them. <laughs> You're not getting those nylons. And I'm not putting you in pictures, either. <laughs> now, look, we've got a show to do, so... Hey, Jackson. Hey, Jackson. Uh, come here a minute. Phil, we've got to get on with the show. I know. All right, but... Come here just a minute. I want to I wanna ask you something. Oh, all right. What... What is it? Look at me. <laughs> huh? Do my eyes still twinkle like two stars in the summer sky? <laughs> oh, boy, do you fall for everything you hear? <laughs> I really put one over on you, bud. Now, go ahead, Phil. Pick up that stick and let's have a band number. Okay, pumpkins. Never mind. But I still can't understand how he could shave so close. <laughs>
lady from 29 Palms played by little Schmo Peep and his daughter. I still... Well, as long as we're happy, that's the reason. But I still... I still can't get over how he fooled me. You know, I should have known it was Phil when he stopped at every house, knocked on the door, and said, trick or drink. <laughs> Well, Jack, it's your own fault. You fall in love with every girl you meet, and then you do the silliest thing. I do not. Tell the fellas what happened when I introduced you to that girl in New York. Mary. What happened, Mary? Well, Jack went up to her apartment, <laughs> oh. turned the lights down low, put one arm around her waist and whispered, Darling, I want you to have something to remember me by. Mary. Then he took off his toupee, pulled out three hairs, and stuck them in her locket. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just shows how much I thought of her. Anybody else could grow them back. Me, it cost $30. <laughs> Now, look, kids, we've got an important play to do tonight. It's very important, so let's get on with it. Go ahead, Don, with the introduction. Okay. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we're going to present our version of that stirring, thrilling Warner Brothers production, Dark Passage. <laughs> the story concerns an unfortunate man who is serving a life term in the state penitentiary for murder. But wait, why should I tell his story? Let him tell it. My name is Humphrey Benny. <laughs> <laughs> I was serving a life sentence for the murder of my wife. It was an intentional murder. One night when she went to bed, I turned the electric blanket up too high. <laughs> He never would have caught me if I hadn't put that apple in her mouth. <laughs> the next thing I knew, I was in cell 13 in the state prison. I remember my first meeting with my cellmate. I asked him how long he'd been there. And he said... I've been in this prison for now on to 20 years. <laughs> what are you in for, Curly? Arson. Arson? Yeah, I signed some other guy's name to a check. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's not arson. Sure it is. I signed it Arson Wells. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Curly, you may not have a spoon, but you're sure stir crazy. <laughs> hmm. Say, uh, what are you in for? Murder. Murder? Yes, my wife. I was married to her for one year, and then I killed her. Here's her picture. Hmm. What took you so long? <laughs> I couldn't face it. Tell me, Curly, what kind of clink is this, anyway? Ah, oh, it's not too bad, as long as you don't break the rules. But last year, they threw me in solitary confinement. Solitary? Yes. For two long months, they kept me in a cell all by myself. Sixty days, I was in there all alone. Alone! 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 Gee, that must have been awful. No, I'm crazy about myself. <laughs> What? If I hadn't had a mirror, I would have gone nuts. <laughs> well, this jail could be worse. Hey, wait a minute. Why do the lights turn dim? Ah, oh, they're testing the electric chair. Slugger Wilson goes in there in a few minutes. Look, here comes the guards with him now. So long, Slugger. So long, Curly. <laughs> now hold still, Wilson, while we strap you in. There. Now, guard, get ready to throw the switch. No. No. Please don't. Please don't. Please. Throw the switch. <laughs> cut it off. <laughs> don't cut it off. They're pickles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're, they're pickles, I tell you. <laughs> Wilson. Wilson, it'll be easier for you if you stop squirming. Now stop squirming. Oh, darn it. That's a third cherry broke this week. <laughs> Gee, Curly. I thought Slugger Wilson was supposed to go to the chair in June. Here it is November. Took him four months to eat his last meal. <laughs> oh. Hey, what's that? Ah, uh, some guys in the next cell. They sing all the time. Hmm. Why do they always have such good singers in prison? <laughs> I hate that stuff. Me too. Oh, we wish we had someone to love us. We'd be happy as happy could be. We want someone to take us out of prison. 
Right, trying to get some atmosphere for a prison play. Let me see. Hey, I know him. That's Norman Krasner. He'll be heartbroken to see me here in prison. Hey, Norman! Norman! Look where I am! <laughs> Gee, what a sense of humor. <laughs> well, I better shave. Hey, Curly, where's the hot water? Are you kidding? Ain't no hot water in this cell. What? No hot water? Well, I ain't gonna stay in a jail like this. Hey, guard! Guard, take me to the wharf! Take me to the wharf! So the guard took me to the wharf. I'll never forget that harrowing walk down the long, long corridor. As I passed the condemned cells, the guard said, Poor devils. They're doomed. As I passed the solitary cells, the guard said, Poor devils, they'll go crazy. As I passed the women's cells, the guard said, (laughs) As I passed the work cells, I stopped and went back for the guard. Finally, we reached the warden's office. The guard told me to go in myself. I opened the door. And I faced the kindly old gentleman sitting behind the big desk and said, A warden? Warden? Yes? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of a prison is this, anyway? What kind of cells have you got here? No hot water, no mattresses on the bunks. And our television set doesn't work either. <laughs> and the food is bad, too. Really? What did you have for dinner last night? Well, let me see. We started with soup. Your entree? Hash. Your dessert? Pudding. Your age? 38. (laughs) Now look, Warden, I ain't gonna stand for this kind of treatment, see? You'll stand for it and like it. Now go back to your cell. I won't go back to my cell. Either let me out of here or send me to the electric chair. Do you hear me? Send me to the electric chair. I'd love to, but our light bill's too high now. (laughs) What? Now get back to your cell and stay there. I went back to my cell determined to escape. I planned, I schemed, and after seven long years, I got my chance. A parole came through for number 60734. That was Curly's number. So that night, I knocked him on the head. And changed numbers with them. It worked. They took me to the gate, gave me a new suit of clothes and a five-dollar bill. And they handed me a tube of bubbaloon and told me to blow. <laughs> when I left, I was frightened, confused. Things on the outside were in terrible shape. Financial instability, political unrest, and worse of all, they were wearing them long. There was nowhere to go, nothing to see. I was trudging the lonesome road from the jail towards the city when a car stopped beside me. And a voice said, Want to lift it a town, big boy? I stood there staring for a minute. I couldn't speak. I just couldn't speak. Suddenly it happened. My bubbaloon busted. <laughs> That's better. I can see your face now. Hop in the car, Blue Eyes, and I'll take you to town. Okay, Miss... Miss... Bacall, but you can call me Lauren. Lauren? If you don't feel like calling, just whistle. (laughs) Hop in. You've been in...
in prison, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. How did you know? I saw the picture. Oh. <laughs> You know, it's swell driving along, sitting next to you. I've been in prison so long, I've forgotten what girls look like. That glorious fragrance, that lovely odor. What is it? Gasoline, my tag flakes. <laughs> now, where would you like me to take you? I don't know. This time of the night, it's too late for the Palladium and too early for breakfast at Brenneman's. <laughs> I don't know where to go. Well, I'll tell you what. You can ride up to the top of Mulholland Drive and park. No, thanks. I was up there on Halloween. <laughs> now, look, Lauren, I'm in trouble, see? I just broke out of prison, and they'll be looking for me in a few hours. Well, if that's your problem, I know a plastic surgeon who can change your face so nobody will recognize you. Say, that... No, why should I go to the trouble of having my face changed? They might catch me anyway. You'll still be ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll try it. Then I'll pull a couple of jobs that'll make me rich. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I don't get your angle, big boy. Have you ever thought of going straight? You know, I kind of like you. Have you ever thought of getting married? Yeah. Sometimes I, I think I'd like to get married. Settle down in a vine-covered cottage with a wife and have 10 or 12 children. Get out, mister. This is as far as we go. <laughs> huh? What? Well, this is where that plastic surgeon has his office. Good. Let's go in. The doctor's office was on the second floor. I followed her up the stairs. She was wearing them long, too. <laughs> As we walked down the hall, I began to feel frightened, nervous, and afraid. Lauren sensed how I felt and walked over to encourage me. She kissed me. When I came to, I was in the doctor's office. <laughs> was feeling my pulse with one hand and my wallet with the other. Finally, he said, Mr. Benny, as long as I'm going to change your face, who do you want to look like? I don't know. I, I just don't want to be recognized. Well, I can make you look like a young man or an old man. Or if you really want to disguise yourself, I can put some glass in the back of your head and make you look like a Studebaker. <laughs> Oh, the windshield wipers would drive me nuts. <laughs> but then, if you think looking like a Studebaker would do the trick, go ahead. Very well, I'll call my assistant. Oh, Dr. McNulty! Here I am, doctor. Shall I... Gosh, you sure lost up this guy's face. <laughs> he hasn't started yet. <laughs> now, look, I'm in a hurry. Let's get on with the operation. Very well, I'll go in the next room and put on my gown. Say, Dr. McNulty, will it hurt much? Oh, no, he's the best plastic surgeon in town. Really? Uh-huh. Ten years ago, a man came in to have his nose straightened out, so the doctor sat him down in a chair, stood behind the man, reached down and grabbed the patient's nose in both hands and began pulling up. He pulled and pulled and pulled, and all of a sudden, boing! <laughs> Gee, didn't the guy sue? Why should he? Today, that man is Bob Hope. <laughs> I hope my operation turns out okay. The doctor came back. He was carrying his surgical instruments and he had slipped into his operating gown. He was wearing them long, too. <laughs> he adjusted the ether cone to my nose. I began inhaling. My head began to whirl. I began to hear voices. The light bill's too high now, too high now, too high now, too high now. Then I caught a blurred vision of Lauren looking down at me. She was so beautiful. I wanted to marry her. I cried, Lauren, Lauren. She looked at me tenderly and said, <laughs> Her voice was so beautiful. Suddenly things got dimmer and dimmer. My head whirled faster and faster. And then, and then I passed off. came to. The operation was over. They removed the bandages. I looked in the mirror. It was even better than I expected. I looked like a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> 
I had white sidewall ears. The doctor was pleased, too. He was smiling, and he said... How do you feel, Mr. Benny? I mean, fine, thank you. I was so happy that I ran out of the doctor's office. But my happiness didn't last long. People recognized me. So I went back to the doctor and had my face changed again. This time I looked like a Buick. But people still recognized me. So I had my face changed again. No, I looked like an old mobile. But I still wasn't safe. Not only were people recognizing me, but I was going broke buying license plates. <laughs> it was no use. Finally, in desperation, I sold myself to the smiling Irishman. <laughs> They put a new top on me and made me into a bus. I am now running between Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. All Friends, every worthwhile undertaking usually has a slogan, sort of an identifying phrase to express its purpose. The community chest has one, a fine one which says, everybody benefits, everybody gives. It's sort of like the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's really the purpose of the community chest anyway. So let's all help make the slogan of the community chest a practical aid to the health and welfare of millions of Americans. Everybody benefits, everybody gives. Thank you. Jack, we'll be back in just a moment. But first, quality of product is essential to continuing success. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. L-S-M-F-T. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And fine tobacco is what counts in a cigarette. Remember what happens at the tobacco auctions? Year after year, at market after market, independent tobacco experts can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. Lucky Strike presents The Man Who Knows. Mr. Sidney Curran, tobacco warehouseman of Oxford, North Carolina, has spent 25 years on the tobacco markets. Recently, he said, At auction after auction, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy a tobacco that's got real smoking quality. Fine tobacco that smokes up mild, cool, and fragrant. Smoke Lucky's myself for 26 years. So for your own real deep-down smoking enjoyment, remember, L-S-M-F-T, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. Yes, next time you buy cigarettes, ask for Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned in for the Phil Harris Alice Faye show, which follows immediately. And be sure to listen to A Day in the Life of Dennis Day on Wednesday night. And next Sunday on my own show, I have one, you know. I'm expecting a visit from my next door neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good night, folks. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.